Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. And this is episode 312, the ultimate Uwe Rosenberg tier list. We'd like to thank all of our Patreon backers, you know who you are, for helping us bring you a brand new episode. All right, Anthony, we are back, and thanks to our Patreon backers, we are back with a brand new episode, and of course, it's one of our favorite episodes because we're talking about board games. Yeah! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so every episode is our favorite episode. That's that's a good one. It kind of is because, you know, you, you watch other YouTube channels and they're like, I have an awesome episode for you, and they say that every week, but the reality is... Since we're always talking about board gaming, of course, every episode's awesome. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I'm with you, man. We're talking about the good stuff here. <laughs> I know. So, of, of course, we're going to talk about the latest and greatest in board gaming. And, of course, that means the one and only, the master, Uwe Rosenberg, and his wealth of fantastical games, mostly about farming and odd-shaped puzzle pieces, but nonetheless awesome games and anthony and i will be duking it out and trying to find where they rank in the best way possible anime superheroes because that's really how you should you know rank your uh favorite designers games and uh we'll have a we'll have a really good time talking about that tonight yeah it's gonna be fun yeah we've done best of lists we've done top 10 lists we've done if you like lists now we're doing a ranked list which typically when you guys listen to this episode we've already ranked it like whatever argument goes on in the background you don't hear that (laughs) today we've chosen one of the designers with which there are two individual games that we disagree on so strongly that this is going to be fun so (laughs) absolutely and it's funny thing too is that most people don't realize that everything that we do and say is unscripted so i have no idea what we're going to bring into this i don't know whether it's going to kind of play out and a lot of people think this is all pre-recorded and it is not we are live on twitch on board game arena but unfortunately for the very first time we are not on board game arena at least their homepage. so we don't have our usual giant community joining us here they think that we're there but unfortunately we're not there this week but we are still live on twitch and of course we are on all of your favorite podcast players so when you listen to this on wednesday here's a great new episode for you anthony but that's not all that's going on bga obviously some technical issues this evening but there is a little bit of a change to the schedule why don't you fill everybody in on that yeah yeah absolutely yeah so if y'all been following us for a little while now we've been recording on mondays and wednesdays 8 30 p.m eastern time and going forward we're going to still be doing 8 30 p.m Wednesday evening every week uh, with our BGA Live, our flagship show. We love having you all there. It's it's a blast, and it's one of our favorite parts of the week. So we're going to keep doing that. But we are going to be moving the the podcast here. Instead of presenting it live every week on Twitch and then releasing it separately on um, the podcast players on Wednesday, we're just going to be releasing it audio only. So we're not going to be recording live any longer on Monday evenings. But the reason for that is that we want to produce some more unique types of content, right? So YouTube content, different types of of video content that we're not doing right now because we don't necessarily have the time or the resources because we are on Twitch, you know, twice a week. So definitely stay tuned. If you haven't yet, follow us on YouTube. It's right there at the bottom of the page, uh, Board Gamers Anonymous. Um, We're going to be posting more content there. That includes the the video of the tier list we're going to make tonight. We're going to put that up on YouTube later this week. So if you just want to watch that part, please make sure you do. If you're listening right now and you want to see the visuals of it, please uh, head on over to YouTube. It'll be up there. And stay tuned. There's going to be more stuff down the line. So this is not like us stopping or canceling or anything like that. We're just kind of reapportioning resources um, and and making sure we can do the stuff that people are asking for and that we're really excited to do. Yeah. Over the last several months since we started Board Game Arena, we've gotten more and more requests from people and publishers out there to produce more content, but obviously that takes a lot more time, a lot more energy, a lot more effort, and unfortunately, a lot more money. So initially, I think we were talking about doing a video kind of series, 
And we even talked about doing a live series on Twitch every day on Board Game Arena. So you would have content every night on Board Game Arena. So right now, unfortunately, we're a stretch a little thin and we want to kind of produce the best content that you want. So obviously hit us up. Let us know what you'd like to hear, like to see. It means a lot to us that you do connect with us because everything we do, we do for you all out there. So thanks again for listening, for watching, and for joining us on all of our social media platforms, especially as Anthony said, YouTube. YouTube tends to be the place where everyone looks for board games. And we've had a YouTube channel up there for a while that has all the podcasts on there. And of course, if you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, not a big surprise to you, but it's going to be a big surprise to everyone else. So please do go to YouTube and subscribe there because you're going to see a lot more content. All right, Anthony. So that's what's going on with Board Gamers Anonymous and our kind of streaming habits. But we do still have the latest and the greatest in board gaming going on, Board Game Arena. So let's talk about BJ Live. BJ Live this week, we're going to be talking about Carnegie. This is the, uh, it, this one up, actually a little while ago, there was a Kickstarter that was running, and we just weren't able to bring the pieces together and get this this episode ready for you during the Kickstarter. But the game's still up on Board Game Arena, and it's still coming down the line sometime later this year. So we've had a chance to play this several times ourselves. A lot of people have requested it, and so we're going to make it happen. So this Wednesday, episode 22, um, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, we're going to do Carnegie on Board Game Arena. So uh, make sure you check that out. It's going to be not just a big episode, but a lot of fun. A lot of crazy cool stuff going on in that game. It'll be a lot of fun to kind of walk you all through it. Absolutely. So check us out when you're listening to this podcast or watching on YouTube that evening, Wednesday evening, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will be live playing a pretty great game. So we'll have more stuff going on for you then. All right, Anthony. So that's everything that's going on with us on Board Gamers Anonymous and Board Game Arena. Let's talk about what our listeners and our viewers are talking about. What's our question of the week? All right. So I, I figured I'd start the shenanigans early tonight. Oh, no. <laughs> I actually, several people asked me why I posted this and they knew it was me because they're like, why would you post this? This must be Anthony. <laughs> What's the best game with polyominoes? Question of the week. <laughs> Just for you, man. Just for you. Uh, polyominoes. <laughs> oh man. Yep. It's one of my favorite mechanics. It's one of your least favorite. And therefore we must talk about it constantly. I um, guess so. <laughs> someone has to pay for it. <laughs> Yep, we're going to do it. So we got 20 different responses on Facebook, several on Twitter as well. Thank you to everybody who, who wrote, um, especially those of you who are worried about Chris's mental health on this episode. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, guys. First on the list, I had to start with this. It's my favorite. Uh, it's a lot of people's favorite. Isle of Cats. So uh, our, our good friend Tim posted, he said, Isle of Cats. Yes, Chris, for real. No. <laughs> after just a couple of plays i wanted to make sure to own the expansion so we put in a 150 dollar order with a regional online board game store just to get the free shipping and now here we have it isle of cats uh a2 tim a2 what what are you doing man like there come on come on no no not tim no <laughs> you were the you were the chosen one you were supposed to save us from the polyominoes with your Excellent Archmage game. Come on, man. Area control. Area control. You know what it's what's all about. Jeez. Yeah. And it's not just him. Matt mentioned it. Uh, we had Kelly who mentioned it. Tim, another Tim mentioned it. So Isle of Cats. Oh, Dead Squirrel mentioned it as well. <laughs> well, look, they were all getting paid by a big polyomino. We know that. We know that the, the votes weren't real. We will eventually do a recount and we will show that, uh, you know, oddly shaped, strangely extravagant cats on a pirate ship, I think, is just a weird oddity for some reason. I love it, man. I don't, I don't even know. And you haven't even played it, so I don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> where, where and when in my life am I going to have that much time available to sit down and go, you know what? Isle of Cats. This is an Isle of Cats night. Because, you know, I have that kind of time. I mean, I don't partake in any kind of, like, illegal substances, so I can't see this happening. But, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we'll maybe one day when we get back to, you know, post-COVID kind of situations, we could do a charity auction again. 
and then like at the upper 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 tier like basically like save a village or build a hospital it'll be like chris you know we chris will you know play a uh, isle of cats if you donate a billion dollars for that hospital and <laughs> You know, and then I'll be like, oh, maybe. Then I'll have to think about it. But all right, I'm also allergic to cats too, which is a completely separate thing. But it's actually true. So I don't know. <laughs> You're like thing I'm allergic to plus polyaminos. It's also something I'm allergic to. <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely are. All right, so that's Isle of Cats. That was the number one answer. Uh, another one that popped up here was um, My City. So this is a a new one from Reiner Knizia that came out this last year. Uh, it's a legacy game, which is interesting. Uh, it's a polyomino legacy game. so And it's kind of a family weight game. Most polyomino games are family weight. But uh, it, I've heard a lot of good things. I have not personally had a chance to like get through this game uh, because that just in, a legacy game in my house involves getting people to sit down multiple times in a row to do something. It's not going to happen, but I've heard good things. Yeah, no, I mean, it's another interesting take on the legacy mechanics so yeah why not yeah mm-hmm. um patchwork of course you can't hate on patchwork right it's patchwork <laughs> you'll have to wait until our feature review where i'll see if i love or hate it good luck people <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna get you on one we're gonna get one up there um and then a feast for odin which we'll also talk about later Obviously, the reason I put this in here this week is because last week we talked about worker placement. This week we're talking about polyominoes. It's our Uwe Rosenberg episode. Those are the two things he's known for. So we, we had to throw out as many of these as we could. Some of the other answers in here, um, and a feast for Odin, we had several people. Uh, Kyle, Jeff, um, George, several people mentioned this. Mm-hmm. But another one that I, I didn't get a picture up for was Project L. This is one that was on Kickstarter not too long ago. Uh, Martin, in particular, had a good answer for this. He said he really likes Project L. It's a short and sweet little puzzle game. Um, he specifically finds it hard to find good polyomino games, though. He feels it's a genre he really wants to like, but so many games fall flat. Uh, might be tied to the level of setup and cleanup required. I, I don't disagree with that, actually. We'll talk about a, a handful of the games in even Rosenberg's library that fall flat for me with the polyominoes. They're not all great. Sometimes it's just like, here's the puzzle. There's no game around it. So we will talk about that. I do agree with that to some degree. Um, but Project L is one of those ones I, I definitely want to try. I did not back it, but hopefully I get a chance next year. Yeah, we t- I talked about it in one of the acquisition disorders. It was really interesting. It was a minimal design, and it was kind of, like you said, drafting kind of, I want, you know, like you said, the po- polyomino puzzle placement kind of thing. Very different. Very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So that that is our question of the week. Thank you to everybody who wrote in. As always, we appreciate it. Um, it was a lot of fun. Of course, obviously, trolling each other is always fun. Um, but a lot of good answers as well. So hopefully that helps other people out there, too, when they're following to see the recommendations that pop up in the Facebook page. Absolutely. And uh, be sure to straighten out your cats after you polyomino them, because that's that's animal cruelty, people. Animal cruelty. All right, so that's our question of the week. Again, if you'd like to join our question weeks and defend me against all the polyominoists out there, uh, please join all our social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. So question of the weeks go out all the time, and we would love to hear from you. And, you know, if that stuff is good and it's out there, we'll talk more about it on the podcast and on the live stream. All right, Anthony, so that's what's going on with us. That's what's going on with our listeners. Let's get on to the games that we want to hit the table. Let's talk about our acquisition disorders. All right. Yeah, fun stuff this week. Um, I apparently missed this. It was announced back in December, I think. Um, There's a new Root expansion coming out, the Marauder expansion. Uh, And I believe it's going up on Kickstarter this month. If not this month, like early next month. But very soon, this this is ready to go. And, I mean, Root's one of my favorite games of all time. It's number two on my list, I think. And any new content they can throw in there, 100% on board, day one, got to do it. So I will be backing this and whatever Clockwork expansion additions that they put in there for the other factions, super on board. <laughs> and I'm hoping that I get more plushies too, because I have, I've got the Woodland Alliance and I've got the Vagabond. Bring on the rest. I don't care. <laughs> uh, but this in particular game, uh, we have two new factions, of course. That's what we do with each expansion. 
Um, we have two expansions already. They each have two new factions. This time we have two more. The first is the Warlord. So the Warlord is our little rat friend there. And they will be moving through, uh, basically trying to take over. That's a Warlord, right? And to do that, though, they're going to burn stuff down. So they're going to burn down clearings and forests alike. Don't really know how that's going to work yet, but we're like speculating on it here locally about, you know, maybe we'll have like Ragnarok style tokens that you put down on top of the forest so the Vagabond can't move in there anymore. That seems really cool. Um, they can destroy the buildings of other factions. It spreads out so they can hit from further away. It's like a ranged attack almost on the buildings. Um, they can also plunder crafted items from other players, which is really cool because once you get those crafted items, they don't really do anything in the game um, except for like, swapping with the vagabonds if the vagabonds not in the game they don't do anything they're just worth points and then you have the token and that's it so someone coming along and stealing it from you awesome <laughs> um so yeah the warlord seems really cool I'm, I'm excited to see how that works the other one is the stone seekers these are the badgers on the left so these guys um there are lost relics scattered throughout the woods and your job is to, you know, build the way stations. Basically, you're building roads around the map that other players can use. So it's similar like to how the otters work, but instead of the rivers, you're using roads that you're going to put together. Um, and then you're going to build alliances with other factions to try to get the relics, right? So it's kind of mixing mechanics from different parts of the game. You got some vagabond pieces, some river otter pieces, uh, and you know, they're not they're one of those they're not focused on the combat like the warlord is a very combat focused uh faction Th these guys are less so they're more like again like the otters how they don't they're not going around trying to kill people they can they can be mercenaries too but they're not really about that um these guys don't seem to be either so i love that as well i i like the idea of adding more combat elements to the game because that part of it is a little staler because most of the factions don't really focus on that as much uh but um also really excited for the stone factions um the the big thing too about this is they say that these factions are suitable for like two player uh which most of the stuff in the game is not like if you've ever tried to play root two player you know that it just doesn't really work very well it, you know it tells you which factions can work two player sometimes you can put the dummy stuff in with like the clockwork expansion or whatever you want to do there it, it still just doesn't really work so these ones make it a little more functional um and then there, uh, so it says you can have an option of up to five different two-player factions you can play with. So a lot more options that way. Um, and then the last thing, sorry, <laughs> I was like checking my notes, minor factions. So these ones can be introduced to kind of give you special abilities um, outside of your main faction's ability of like a, a minor faction that you can work with on the side. Uh, so new power combinations, obviously, because you have, we're going to have what now? 10 different factions plus the minor factions on top of that. So lots of different combinations that you can have. Um, it, yeah, it just, it sounds really cool. It's a lot of exciting stuff. They generally change a lot during play testing, especially after the Kickstarter is over. So, you know, who knows how these things will end up in the end, but right now, as it is, I'm all in, I'm definitely going to back this when it goes up. So more root that they're saying, this is probably the last expansion. We'll see. Sometimes people say that and they're, they think it's something else, but, um, I'm all for it. All right. Yeah, no, Root's fantastic. And again, more of the same high quality, especially the different play styles is fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, this is completely turning into a lifestyle game. Yeah. I mean, it's like, can you memorize? Can you remember all the different factions? Can you possibly play out all the different combinations? I don't know, but, you know, it'd be nice to try, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, I've played this game 30 times, I think, and I still I still have not played with every faction because, you know, you kind of rotate through them based on what other people have played. And for whatever reason, I still haven't played with the Lizards. There's eight factions, so, yeah. you know, that means I've played most of them two or three times. It's you, And to really get good at one, you want to play it like 10 times. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy the amount you'd have to play this to get up there. What's your uh, favorite faction? Oh, um good question i i really like the birds i like breaking that puzzle like when i make it work it's a lot of fun uh i also really liked the corvid conspiracy that was a lot of fun like messing with people like the bluffing element of that was a lot of fun as well um okay. I, I generally like all of them there's just a couple i don't like as much like the cats aren't very much fun because that's like yeah. the intro race 
you know, Woodland Alliance is a lot of fun. If people ignore you, you can just blow everything up. That's always cool. <laughs> no one expects the Woodland Alliance. Nope. And they blow up in your face and you're like, oh yeah, you guys are playing. Yeah. yeah. Dang it. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I want to talk about a new Kickstarter campaign that's currently up. This is Clinic Deluxe Extensions. Two new extension boxes for Clinic Deluxe Edition containing more than 25 expansions for a level of simulation probably never reached. I would really agree with that. Again, yeah. these games are more and more becoming lifestyle games where, you know, it just, it just reminds me back in the day when we used to play games, when we first started out in the hobby and we used to talk about board gaming we're like look this is a game you're going to have probably for the rest of your life you could pass it on to your kids you could play 20 years from now it's a board game it's not going to go out of style it's not going to go out of date you just need as much replayability as possible and clearly there was a monkey's paw involved in that because we have so much as far as content is concerned so this is alban viard's great reprint of his original clinic and we've talked about clinic quite some time clinic is a fantastic game it, it replicates the healthcare system in so many good and bad ways and your object is to run the most efficient hospital possible which sometimes means that you do some things that are not maybe as ethical as possible now clinic's big box edition with ian o'toole's artwork is phenomenal we've already rated it reviewed it it is definitely a buy. We talked about his most recent expansion that came out on an acquisition disorder. Still just got it in, I think, the other day. Haven't been able to get to the table. We also talked about his COVID expansion. We already talked about that. That was fantastic. Not to mention the fact that the money went to people in need in the hospital systems. So fantastic. Overall, really, really great. Now, let's talk about the second and third expansion that was not play tested until now but has had the opportunity to play into those things now we're talking about more of the same now that's always good for expansions if what you're looking for is already quality so you of course and again one of the great things about this game is the meeples in this game are really specially crafted and colored so you really do feel like you're building this hospital it really is a a real physical experience because there is dimensionality to the game where how you place out the different rooms in the hospital, how they're spaced apart, how you move the patients, the doctors, the nurses, all the, the essential staff there really matters because it really does play into the game in a real big way. So this is not just like, oh, cool, you're taking a couple of actions. So it's an action selection and then you score points. Nope. There's action selection there's building elements, there is movement elements, there is like selection of different staff and and patients, how sick do you let them get? There's a lot of dynamics into this game. This is a rather complex, heavy, crunchy game, but never at any point is it overwhelming. There's just an overwhelming number of choices to make. So with this expansion, again, you're going to get the meeples, you're going to get new rooms to be able to help people out. So more emergency rooms, more radiology hubs and such. And most importantly, because there's so much complexity to this game, they're also releasing a campaign book. So it will help guide you as far as what to put together when you're actually playing this game, because it has definitely reached a point where if you did throw everything in, in like one game, the game would never end. It would just be way too much. It would just be way too chaotic. This campaign book allows you to be able to put together games for game night that's actually playable how you want to play them. So there are three modes to this. There's normal mode, which is basically the base set and a couple of combinations that come into play. And it actually lays out for you how to actually play those games, how to put the pieces together. There's medium mode, which brings in a lot more of the special specialized tiles and specialized actions in the game. Think like the zombies in this game. They're also ghosts for some reason. And then there's the expert mode, which will actually have a really detailed campaign to it where you actually play out the real life story of one of the medical professionals. So you might play 
as a nurse, a doctor, a surgeon, or somebody working in the hospital, and your job is to get through the campaign and meet the goals that they need. So there is a second edition expansion and a third edition expansion, obviously adding more and more to the game. Obviously, you're going to get more HR kind of stuff that we didn't really see too much of before. You're going to get CEO, so a lot more hospital administrations going to come into play. You're going to get secretaries in this game. You're going to get stretchers in this game, a lot more of the medical kind of stuff. There's going to be fire engines. There's going to be a helicopter pad. There's going to be additions of cigarettes. There's going to be addition of wheel wheel cap, you know, accessible tiles and, and parking spots, which... Okay, because there's a big parking lot that goes into play as far as how you kind of manage everything at the table. So there's so much here. There's helicopters, there's air conditioning units, and I mentioned earlier, there's ghosts. So if you are interested in clinic, this is definitely something you should take a look at because it adds more of the same and including having the campaign book, which is free with your pledge. I think it's a really great system to take a look at. Now, there is a lot of different backer campaign levels to this. So you could just back these into two, two expansions, or you could back the whole entire game. If you've never either played or purchased a game whatsoever, this campaign allows you to buy it all at once. So the two expansions themselves, you can pick one up for 40. Uh, obviously, if you go really crazy and you want to buy everything, it's going to cost you 174, but actually it's a pretty good deal considering what you get. If you're interested, Clinic Deluxe Extensions is available until Sunday, February 28th at 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So check it out. Yeah, this is crazy. Like, it went up. I backed it immediately. I didn't really read anything because I was like, oh, I love Clinic. I'll just get the stuff. And then later I was looking back through it because we were going to talk about it today. and And I didn't realize this is bringing it up to almost 50 modules for the game. Crazy. It's crazy. And I knew yeah. that these two would be big because he released extension four before extensions two and three because he specifically said these two were too big and he didn't have time to play test them because of the pandemic. But man, and I, I kind of always knew this about Album VR. If he likes a game, he keeps working on it. Tramways has like, I don't know, 30 something modules for it, plus a campaign book, plus, you know, all the stuff he's added to it. And this is a better production better game in general so it's not surprising he's doing this but it's a lot of content (laughs) yeah this is the age of kickstarter and i think that's sometimes good and sometimes bad because again if you don't like a game and it's on kickstarter you're almost inevitably going to have to back all of it right up front because otherwise you're going to end up paying another 50 to 100 dollars after it hits like the secondary market so at least here Clinic has been out for a while. You could play the original version and get a, a good feel of the game. The deluxe version has been out there for a while. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to play it. Obviously COVID kind of interfered with some of that. And again, he's the, he does such a great job with everything about the game, the production, the art, the movement, everything here is just top notch. Again, it's just a matter of like, are you interested in the medical system and playing that out? Are you interested in the Yonal Tools artwork? Are you interested in the level of complexity that Album VR brings to the game? And having the campaign book really is needed. It's required. Because, again, as you mentioned, 50 different modules is really just going to blow you away. You never know what to play with, and you do want to play with it all. So, yep, this is becoming a lifestyle game, too. And I think, in fact, he is re-releasing a lot of his other games I think small city is getting a deluxe upgrade as well. So hold on. <laughs> I don't know how. Hold on, because there's more coming. So if Album of Yard's your guy, he's got a lot of good stuff out there. All right, Anthony. So that's what's hitting our table in the future. But what's hitting our table now, we will let everyone know and let them know if those games are a buy and they should run out and pick those games up. If those games are a play and they should sit down and play those. If those games are dodge and they should avoid them all cost, or if those games are the dreaded burn and they should just throw them in the trash as quickly as possible because Album of Yards game's coming through and I have no more room for it in my Kalex. So what do you have up for us this week? All right. Speaking of room in the Kalex, uh, we're going to talk about Hallertau. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. This is the new Uwe Rosenberg game. I figured this was a good week to talk about it. I know uh, that guy. 
yeah, it's he's on the tier list later. <laughs> Who knew? Um, so this is his brand new game. Um, he's released a few games lately, but this is the first like big, big box thing he's done since Newsfjord, and that wasn't even that big box of a game. It was just expensive. So <laughs> Hallertau, it's longer, it's meatier, it's got a lot more going on. It feels like a traditional Rosenberg in a lot of ways, but it also doesn't in a few ways. And there are no polyominoes, so you will be happy to hear that, sir. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so it is a worker placement game, but you, do, you don't have your own workers because the amount of workers you can get is variable depending on several other factors. So it's just little blue cubes. Uh, so that first picture here, we have to pull that up. Um, you can see all the little spaces there uh, on the screen. Um, the, so, sorry, I'm getting caught up here. Um, so you're gonna use little blue cubes and those are just gonna come from a common supply. You start the game with six per round, but you can get up to 12, 13, whatever it might be, depending on how many spaces you wanna have on your community center as you move them over um and, and so you personally have four boards in front of you you have a field board where you're going to plant stuff and store your goods you have a farming board where you're going to have these different cards that will come into your hand eventually but also track the momentum of the game it takes place over six rounds um and then you have this kind of community center slash background board where you have uh i think five or six different types of you know goods, products, whatever, um, carpentry, brew house, cooling house, etc., And those will move over based on how you spend your goods at the end of each round. But you also have to move the boulders out of the way, which costs tools. So basically the flow of the game is you will put your workers out to generate various goods, to plant various things, to build up your fields, to generate a ton of resources. And then at the end of each round, spend all those resources to move over um, all those different trade types and then if all of them move over, at least one, your community center slides over one and it will show a new number underneath it. That's how many workers you get in the next round. Now, why does that matter? Because eventually if you slide far enough over, there's points under there, a lot of points. <laughs> like the first one, I believe at 13. So that's like if you've moved it seven times is um, 18 points. Then it runs to 30 something and then 70 something. So you want to do that because you're never you're not going to score much of anything unless you do that. Most of the rest of your points are going to come from sheep, which are worth like a point each. Leftover goods at the end, you get like four or five points from that. And then the cards that you play. Um, and so cards are a big part of any Uwe Rosenberg game. You're always going to have cards in the game. This one has the most cards I've seen in a Uwe Rosenberg game. It's a ton of cards. Like out of the box, you're getting like 500 cards. Ton of cards. So... You have your farming deck. That's You start with some in your hand, plus you get the six off of your board, one per round. Um, you have gate cards that you'll start with a few in your hand. There are bonus cards. Um, there's a additional like community market cards. And some cards, when you complete them, will have you draw more cards, like bonus cards that come into your hand. But there's also worker placement spots for each deck of cards. You can draw more cards as the game goes on. If you're like, no, I really want to draw more cards from the bonus deck and try to build up some abilities between the rounds, you can do that. So at the end of the game, I had like 10 or 12 cards in the tableau in front of me. It's not like a Feast for Odin where you have like two or three. There was like a dozen and then like 10 more in my hand. Like there's a ton of cards. You're going to see a bunch. There's also multiple decks of cards. So you can, which is pretty common for, for Rosenberg. You're going to choose which decks you want to use based on the level of game you want to play. So there's like a beginner deck, you know, a more intermediate deck, an advanced deck. And then there's a whole separate decks set for the gates. Um, overall, very interesting take on a lot of familiar mechanics, right? The worker placement is very familiar. You have, I think, 12 different locations out there or something like that, and they are static. The worker placement locations don't change at any point. Um, they're they're going to be the same every game. In each of them, they have three locations you can go. The first one costs one worker, the second costs two, and the third costs three. And then each round, you're going to remove the topmost row from each of those sections based on the number of players. So if a place has all three locations are full and nobody can place there, the next round, only one of those spaces is going to open up. So 
late in the game, especially certain locations are difficult to come by, like sowing the plants that you need so you can harvest them and use them to move all your pieces over gets very difficult if those are you know all full and only one of them is going to pop off at the end of the round. You have to plan ahead and you can see what's going to happen. So you definitely have to plan further and further out. Um, this does have a solo mode, but it's a typical Uwe solo mode. You just play the game by yourself. There's no, <laughs> nothing changes. Um, it is nice because like the little reminder cards and the deck that shows you like when to move stuff where it does indicate solo play on them. So you don't have to like reference the rule book. You just play the game and the cards come out. And you run it like normal, but it's just a high score thing. You know, it's the typical Uwe Rosenberg solo. It's not super interesting. Um, but it plays quickly. You don't have to change the setup at all, which is nice. And, you know, the score that they've set for you to hit, the 100 points, seems very difficult. <laughs> like, um, Feast for Odin and Caverna both had that 100 point threshold. And I think I hit those relatively quickly after playing them a few times. This one, I think my first score was 41. So, <laughs> like, this is going to take a while to get there. Um, yeah, Howler Tale is awesome. It's, it's really good. I, I personally like News Fjord a lot but not because it's like a big, huge, mega Uwe game. It's because it was smaller and more condensed and it was easy and quick to get to the table. This feels like something that he would have released, you know, six, seven years ago. Big box, big ton of stuff going on here. Lots of play testing, lots of cards, you know, and we haven't gotten that since A Feast for Odin, which was 2015. So very excited for this. So glad it's actually good and interesting. Um, some of the bits are a little fiddly. The, the sheep feel a little weird uh, because it's the only animal. And they don't breed, which is weird for a new Bay game. But, um, and, and the, your little bits and how you keep track of them, because you get so many goods, you get like upwards of 10, 15, 20 at times. You have like a little track to keep track of how many, kind of like the Caverna cave versus cave track. Sure. You don't actually hold 20 pieces. You put pieces on the five and that's five, right? So that can get fiddly if you bump it. But other than those like little things, like, quality of life things almost i had a lot of fun with this so i can easily see myself playing this a lot more i cannot wait until i can get this out with everybody else because right now it's you know solo play and maybe i can needle somebody into two player with this but i haven't got a chance to play with four yet that's the full game where you don't have to adjust anything uh and i'm really looking forward to it so howler tell a buy for me super happy that this actually came out on time and <laughs> got a chance to play it when i did and um yeah, definitely track this one down if you are jonesing for a classic Uve game and uh, no more puzzle pieces for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a chance to go through all the playthroughs online. I've ordered this quite some time ago. I'm waiting for it to still be delivered. So this should have been in my hands by now. But nonetheless, I again, obviously with your review and everything else I've heard and I read through the rulebook on this, it utilizes a lot of his other concepts from other games, right? You have the Agricola concept where there's just a ton of cards that you're going to utilize to build some kind of massive engine. And then of course it's utilizing all of his traditional farming mechanics. So, you know, again, Agricola, as far as like plowing the fields, putting out the resources out there. I mean, we, we see that in like the gates of Loyang, right? Where you have those kind of like yeah. those, their fields out there. And then you, you get to decide what vegetables you put out there. And then, you kind of keep track of them on this this chart. So it's not like a, a ton of stuff on there, but it's where, where it kind of ranks. And obviously the Feast for Odin kind of stuff where the worker placement, it's just you have to keep adding more workers to do actions. So, and I'm sure there's a lot more mechanics here that are, are related to once we actually get the game in here. But yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that he's back to utilizing his best techniques and to kind of put together a like top-notch game. I think they, they kind of say it's like expert level heavy kind of thing. It doesn't look that bad. Is it that bad? Is it is it that kind of like, it, you know, where does it where does it rank as far as complexity is concerned with his other games? About the same. I, I don't know. It didn't feel like it didn't feel particularly more complicated. It's easier to grasp than like a feast for Odin or Fields of Arl, but those are sandboxy where you really need to know what all the different actions are. Gotcha. This has a lot of actions that you can take, but there's a lot of overlap between them. There's really only a few things you're doing. You know, you're planting things, harvesting things, trading things, and then doing stuff with sheep, right? <laughs> like, um, it's... And 
the real thing that matters in this game is understanding the flow of goods to another, right? Like certain goods are harder to get. So if you're going to trade a good in for a different type of good, like, oh, if you, you know, trade in two hops and you'll get three of this other thing. Well, is that worth it for you based on what you're trying to accomplish? And certain goods you can only get from the worker placement spots. Like if you need bricks, you can't grow bricks. So you need to think ahead and make sure you're getting the bricks you need from the worker placement locations. So it's all about like logistics and managing the resources you have and where they come from. Sure. That's where the complexity comes in. And the actual rules of the game are fairly simple. All right. Yeah, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to it. It should be here any day now. So hopefully I'll be able to get to the table soon. All right, so I want to talk about a game that unfortunately haven't gotten to the table yet either. But thankfully, thanks to Board Game Arena, Car Carnegie, or Carnegie, depending on how you, how you pronounce his name, has been at my online table, has been at my tablet. So Carnegie, or Carnegie again, is a game about being the most influential entrepreneur and benefactor you could possibly be back in i guess way back in the early days of industry in america and as we are kind of like reinventing ourselves a little bit and kind of looking at the world he did some great things for charity he did some great things for the world and then some not so great things but the game itself by javier george uh, obviously does a lot of really amazing things. And again, um, George is here is really well known for Twa, for Ginkopolis. Um, one of my favorite games, Carson City. He's recently done Black Angel. So a lot of games that we've all got to the table from one time or the other. The artwork is from Ian O'Toole. So again, beautiful piece of artwork, beautiful board. And the game itself is, you know, creating and benefiting society and working with industry in the U.S. So the board itself is a map of America, kind of slimmed down and kind of just abstracted out a bit. And your job, as far as this game is concerned, is to run your company to the best to your ability and then throughout the game, pay, donate money to philanthropy, to different charities in order to score end game victory points. So basically, that's one of those areas I really like. Shipyard does that really well where... I'm going to make a decision what my end scoring bonuses are going to be. Obviously, you could score points through the game. Obviously, you can score points through a number of measures. But the philanthropy bonuses are really going to make you or break you in the game. So the game itself is interesting for a number of different reasons. So as you're operating your company to get the most out of it, you are utilizing different departments in that company to manage all the resources that are happening. So the board itself, the actual player board that's going to select the actions on your turn, you will select one of the actions in four different possible rows. And when you select that action, you will be able to activate one of those kind of special action abilities. So as this timeline goes on, you will be not just activating a particular area of the map to score workers, but you'll also be operating that particular action so as the game goes on you're operating those different timeline rows the events take place and the events themselves are based upon the different departments you have so recently uh, we played a lot of games that are all about choosing what actions you want when you choose everyone has to take that action so some of the actions are basically and primarily when it deals with the map it's about taking income so hopefully you've sent out your meeples, your workers on these missions to be able to collect income. And when you select an action in a particular area, you'll be able to pull back those meeples in order to receive that income. Beyond that, what you'll be able to do is possibly, based on what timeline you activate, you'll also be able to make a donation. Again, that scores you victory points at the end of the game. But primarily, taking the actions allow you to utilize the different departments that are really going to score you points and manipulate different things on your own player board so that you can have workers in the right departments in order to utilize their abilities. How do you do that? Well, first, you have human resources. There are human resource departments with meeples on them, and that will allow you to move your workers to different departments in order to have a proper staff so that you can send them out missions and you can activate them. 
In addition to that, there is straight up management that allows you to score money or score resources that you need to be able to operate and build in the different cities. It's essential for the game. And despite the challenges of the game, money was never really too much of a problem. On top of which, you're going to need the money and the resources because you're going to do another possibility, which is construction. So construction is really important because what you're going to be able to do is connect the different city hubs up with other city hubs. And those links will score you massive amounts of points if you're able to connect all the big cities together. It's difficult to do because as you're building in those cities, so is everybody else. So the spots are pretty limited and there's limited number of each type of spot in that particular area. But as you go on, you're building in those cities. And finally, there's research and development like all companies have. So the R&D department is all about maximizing your special abilities and the different construction hubs that you're building. So maybe you're building housing or maybe you're building industry. Whatever you're building, by researching and developing, you're getting more back for that particular construction type. So as the game goes on, you're scoring money, you're scoring resources. And again, the idea of the game is to have the right bonuses philanthropy-wise to score victory points, get the right different network chains together to score victory points. And then there's a lot of other little minor victory point action situations throughout the game. Basically, that's Carnegie. And, you know, I enjoyed the game. I do like the central place action board that when I take an action, everyone takes an action. And I also did like the fact that the resources in the different departments varied greatly. So as the game goes on, you could add different departments to your company. And they could be similar to other people or slightly different, depending on how you activate them. But basically, I got to build my own company with different departments. And that was kind of fun. That being said, the U.S. map does limit and restrict some of the fun of the game just because it's really a very solid map. So if you're not playing with the maximum player count, you are blocking out certain locations, you're blocking out certain victory point locations in the game, some philanthropy points in the game, and that's a real bummer because you don't really get to play the game to its full ability. So I wouldn't recommend it to smaller player counts, even though it's 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 still a good game. The maximum player count, so you do have everything available to you. I do wish the, the map was modular or it was even a little more abstracted so that there were different paths to victory. But as it stands, it's still a very good game, and I would recommend it as a probably a very strong play. And I will take a look back when it actually gets into full production, because it could be a buy. But right now, I play it on Board Game Arena, and it's definitely a play. Yeah, I think I agree with you, like across the board there. Like, I enjoyed my play of it. Um, it was fun. It, it was intuitive. Everything made sense. Mm -hmm. um, Xavier George's games are funny because it, it feels like a bunch of discordant systems. And when you're learning it, you're like, I, uh, yeah. but like after a round, it all kind of yeah. does this somehow. Um, that's been my experience with almost all of his games that I've played. It's just, it, it only takes like 15 minutes and all of a sudden it all clicks into place. And that's like impressive. So similar thing here, really enjoyed. It's very pretty, you know, tool artwork, obviously. And um, thematically, it's interesting because I've, I've lived here in Pittsburgh for the last six years. Um, everything in Pittsburgh is named after this man. Yes. So it's, it's just interesting to, you know, play a game about his life. And I love so many games about capitalism, but I love that the primary way you're going to score points at the end of the game is not capitalism, but philanthropy. Like, yes, it's a big part of it. I, I wish we saw more of that in games. I agree. Where combine the themes bridge out of it somehow i don't know um and it's true to his life so it's thematic but it's also just interesting because you're not just trying to make money right you're trying to have an impact on the world which is which is kind of a cool idea yeah. um for me too though yeah i think it was a play i i did not end up backing the kickstarter i was very on the fence towards the end but i ended up holding on it um get a chance to play it a little bit more later but i do enjoy it i'm looking forward to wednesday it'll be fun to to play through it again yeah, so if you're listening to the podcast or you're watching this on YouTube on Wednesday, jump back with us at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because we are playing Carnegie live on Board Game Arena and BGA Live is hosting it. So check out our Twitch channel and follow us there so you could, you know, join in the fun. 
All right, Anthony, so that's everything that's hitting our table. We want people to play those great games. But we have one of the greatest designers of board games of all time, and he is on our feature review. So for our feature review this week, we are talking about the guy, if you're doing farming, if you're doing worker placement, if you're doing anything with a guy named Uwe, it better be Uwe Rosenberg, because that man knows how to throw down a game on the table. And we are taking it to the next level, not (laughs) old-fashioned farming, or actually, in fact, we're taking old-fashioned farming and updating it with, like, super high technology, at least for Twitch is concerned. And we're ranking those games, man. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we're doing it. We're doing a – this is – it's a silly thing. Like, you brought this up originally, and I I was vaguely familiar with these videos. I think my son has watched a few of them, like Minecraft characters or Mario characters ranked like this. Yeah. And I didn't realize how, you know, you could just – Put any pictures you want in here, and I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> Uwe Rosenberg, he's got a lot of games, and we, you know, we have some contentious uh, opinions about some of them. So, yeah, we've got all. Oh, I think I put 35, uh, 34. I have 34 of his games in here, um, and we're gonna put them into the various tiers. We've got our buy, play, dodge, burn rating scale, of course, and then essential. We'll we'll elevate some above the buy level as. These are must-haves, the absolute cream of the crop. Absolutely. And, and again, uh, everybody in their chat, everyone who's following us, obviously, unfortunately, we're not able to be embedded on Board Game Arena tonight. But if you do have a strong opinion or if you'd like to help us with a tiebreaker, shout it out in the Twitch chat because we'd love to hear from you. All right, Anthony, we've played, I think, practically everything here, which is fantastic because all of Uwe Rosenberg's games have generally been just knocked out of the park each and every time. And eventually, like everything else in life, it needs to be ranked. (laughs) And we need to see where everything kind of fits. So what do we have up first? Well, I guess that's the question. Sure. How do we want to approach this? Because we could go in the order they're listed, or we could get the easy ones out of the way, right? Like some of these we know are dodges or burns. There's only a couple. Some of these we know are essentials or buys, and then we, you know, whatever's left, maybe we have the argument over. I don't know. Like, what's what do you think the best way to approach this is? Well, I, I think the thing about most designers out there, I mean, they certainly have their best games, but typically the stuff that came out early is not always the best games in their collection. So why don't we start way back? you know, at the beginning of his career and then work our way up because I think that's, that kind of will give us a baseline. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's a good idea. Um, it's kind of fun to, to go through these because some of these I haven't even heard of, at least not recently. Sure. Um, and the games I'd really never heard of, I didn't put on the list. He's designed, a, you know, 80 games or something, but a lot of them like in the nineties, no Remember idea what it is. We're not going to dive into that. <laughs> <laughs> Way back when. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so towards the bottom here, the, these lovely ones down here. Yeah. We've got Babel. Uh huh. We've got Mamma Mia. Okay. We've got Mercator. Mm hmm. Bargain Hunter. Uh, we've got Sagani. We've got Yellowstone Park. So those are all games that came out before any of his big work replacement games. Um, Bonanza is actually earlier than a lot of those, but I think that that might even be a separate thing because yeah. that game's not bad. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think his early attempts of some of these games, it shows its age, it shows its oddity of theme, and he really just wasn't in the zone as we will see for every other game that he has in his collection, with the ex- exception of Bonanza, everything else is, is, is totally one or two zones there. So right. uh, again, you know, some of these things are not that great. Uh, I, I guess probably the first one that just pops into my head as a game that I probably would never play is going to be Bargain Hunter. That's something that just, ugh. It's like, this is an Uwe Rosenberg game. It doesn't feel like an Uwe Rosenberg game. It doesn't look like an Uwe Rosenberg game. And generally, I'm just like, I I, I don't want to, you know, diminish the greatness of his games out there. 
but that definitely was something that if he could have went a little further down the line, he would be able to go, yeah, yeah, I wish I could just not put my name to that. So <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go with at the very least a dodge here. Do you, do you see it going any lower or higher there, Anthony? I, I don't think it's lower necessarily. Um, it's just a nothing, right? Like it's a nothing I, game. Yeah. I, I think the nothing games end up in that dodge ranking usually for me. It's got to be like aggressively bad to be a, a bird, <laughs> <laughs> like offensive to my sensibilities. It's not offensive. I think it's just a simple enough worker placement or not worker placement, not trick taking game, right? Yeah, you know but, the problem is is that his stuff is so good that it's almost offensive that this game is in here. So that that would be the yeah. only case that I could argue that some of these games should be burned because they shouldn't be anywhere near his classic games, right? Right, right. All right. Why don't we take... Uh, how about Babel next? I think Babel's a game that a lot of people have played from at one time or the other. Yeah, I, I don't know that I've personally played this one. Have you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, a long time ago. This is not, obviously, again, an, an, one of his older games. And again, unfortunately, despite the fact that he is taking on a new theme, which I do love here, it is another forgettable game. I mean, again... If anyone's going to get attention for his games, it's it's going to be Babel. And it's just a dodge. It's just a generic game. Um, but there are some there's some good older games here. We'll get to that in a second. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's safe to say, you know, we've got Bargain Hunter, we got Babel, Mamma Mia, Yellowstone Park. I, I would I would throw all of those into the dodge category. Not necessarily because they're bad. I know there's there's always going to be people out there who watch this and like, no, those games are good. Why don't you give them a chance? But there's a reason when somebody as famous in this hobby as Uwe Rosenberg has made so many amazing games that these have not come back in any form, right? No one's reprinting these. No one's retheming these. They're just dead in the water to some degree. And it's, you know, it's because they're, man, they don't really fit the brand that is Uwe. Yeah, I think a lot of his games run into that problem, and a lot of the games are like family games when he started out. Mamma Mia, and the chat agrees with me, is probably the only game that I might move up to the play level just because okay. it's a family game that you know utilizes some of the memory kind of mechanics. I mean, it's just a family game. Mm. It's a well-produced right. family game from back in the day. So if you're looking for something family-based... I guess that's something I would recommend as far as a, like a light play is concerned. But yeah, I think, I think I agree with you, Anthony, everything else just fits in the kind of general dodge category. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable putting uh mama Mia up there in, in the play category. I would agree with that. Yeah. The rest of them are like, again, they, they were of their, of their time and age, so to speak. So that's, that's a little rough, but yeah, that that's, that's kind of a thing. All right. So that's those are like the big four going way back. Um, Mercator is also from around that time period. But that's a little bit heavier of a game. That's like him getting into that Euro type of game, yeah. right? Like one of the first ones where he's like, here's something with cubes, right? <laughs> you remember cubes. I'm going to do the cube thing now. Everyone everyone, be really impressed with this now. Yeah, yeah. So like, I, I know I played this uh, way back in the day, and it was very inexpensive. You could get it for a long time. That's pretty cheap. Yes. But it's made zero impression in my brain. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, there's a lot of games that I played, like, before I started tracking games or whatever. And you'd think, like, if those are some of the earlier games you play in the hobby, you'd remember it. But I just, I have no memories of this game whatsoever. I, I guess that speaks to it not being, you know, high on this list. Yeah, this one's a dodge for me as well. I, I think, as you said, this was a nice attempt at a game, but just never really landed. It was something that, you know, I was like, oh, okay. You know, early in the day when Uwe Rosenberg was like the only name out there, I guess, other than Ryan Knizia and a couple of other people, you you just gravitated. You try to grab every game possible to play. And this was one that I was really disappointed with. So, yeah, this is definitely a, in the dodge category. Okay. Um all right, so now for like something completely different in the older game category, yes. Bonanza. Yes. So this was this is the breakout game, right? This is what made him yes, you know, a mega hit, especially in Germany. I know this game has had dozens of expansions. It's it's big here. It's super big there. We played this game all the time, and it was another one of those games that was really funny because you were like, you never like 
this is an Uwe Rosenberg game? Oh, come on. Like, I remember playing this probably about a half a dozen times before I found that it was an Uwe Rosenberg game. And I was just yeah. like, oh, all right. And again, it's so uniquely different about how you hold the cards in your hand, how you plant the beans, how you, you request stuff. It is a radically different game. Again, it's weird that it has not like been reprinted or updated in any way. It's kind of stayed as like really kind of, you know, cutesy kind of nostalgia, but from back in the day. So yeah, I would definitely give this a play. I enjoyed it a lot. I, I could I could be convinced as far as if this game actually goes to a buy, because I don't think that there are many games, if any games like this, even to this day. Yeah, I I'll be honest. I, I would argue to put it up as a buy. I think okay. it's it's wholly unique. I love the idea of, you know, the order of cards and everything matters. Any game that does that, I love it. And there's so many different ways to play it. Like we have the duel on here, but there's also like, you know, introductory version that's more yes. towards children. I have that for my kids and my son loves the puzzle of that. So it's like a really cool, interesting way to introduce those types of mechanics. And it all started with Bonanza. Uh, it's, it's a game I thought I would hate. And even after the first play, I was like, I don't know, I don't know if this is for me, but it just, it gets in there. It sticks in your brain and it's inherently social because of the way that you're swapping the cards around. So I don't know. I, for me, it's actually, it's on that line, but I think I'd put it up towards buy. All right. And the chat agrees with you, Anthony. I, I think I, I'll, I'll be happy to go along with that. Cause I played this a lot. And again, I've never seen a game like this before. So yeah, Bonanza moves up to a buy. Cool. Um, all right, so uh, we also have the Bonanza, the Duel on here. This is the two-player version of this. Uh, I played this a couple times, and it was fine. <laughs> it's like <laughs> sometimes the two-player version of the game is brilliant, like Seven Wonders Duel. Sometimes it's like, oh, this is a passable way to play this game. Yeah, and for me, that's what it was. So I, I would say that's a play. I would agree. agree. Yeah, I'd agree too. Okay. okay, it's not bad. It's not a dodge by any means, but it's not. No, Not up there at that same level as Bonanza. Yeah, you really need all the players to really, you know, blow out a Bonanza. Right. All right. Okay. What's next? So, all right. So that's pretty much everything that's old. Okay. <laughs> you know, every, we have, you know, I've kind of organized these a little bit, like everything in that top row. That's you know his big box stuff, his worker placement type of stuff. You get a little bit further down, you get a lot of polyomino type of stuff, and at the bottom, it's just like oddball random. <laughs> His one-offs. I don't know. Exactly, yeah. I don't know what we want to dive into first. Um, there's a couple of easy ones on here, for me really? at least. Yeah. Uh, Hengist is infamous for being horrible. Yes. <laughs> this one here. And part of it is, he didn't really design this game. No. Right? He just got his name slapped on it. And to be fair... So it's yeah, I mean, if you had a, if you needed someone to, to like vouch for you, yeah, it would be over Rosenberg. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know the the whole story behind that, but I do know that this game is it's not really a, a Rosenberg game, not not in the sense of like something born pure of his mind and he made a game out of it. And you're like, this is good, right? And you're like, yes, of course it is. It's it's bad. <laughs> it's a bad game that I don't want to play. Um, so for me, that's an easy one to drop on the burn pile because I would never buy it. I've seen it on sale for five dollars. I have most of these games I own, and it's just not what I'm going to pick up. I agree. This is this is an other burn. This is the lowest of his low. There we go. Um, another one for me that, and I don't know if you've ever played it, so I don't know if I'm being too harsh on this game, but I really, really disliked Rakehold. Okay. A lot. Did you ever play that? I do. I actually own a copy of it. I don't hate it. I actually like the game. Okay. I, um, huh. It's it's one of those, it's definitely on the lightest side of his, I got vegetables, I got to do something with the man. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and again, it's something that is the family lighter situation. I played this with family and they're like, oh, okay. And I'm like, this is probably the only Uwe Rosenberg I could get you to play at the table. That's one of his farming games. So, yeah. And again, this was on discount for quite some time. So, yeah, I, I did steer away from it because of that. But, no, I don't think it's a bad game. I own it. I, I'm, I'm happy to have it. I don't know if I'd pay full price for it. Probably not. But at a discounted price, it's a good game with the family, a light, a light version at the table. Hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, that makes it tricky. I, I like I really disliked it. It was very expensive. Oh, it wow. was boiled boiled down to almost nothing. It just it was boring. I was okay. immensely bored by that game. So um I'm surprised that you liked it as much as you do. So maybe we'll yeah, hold on I, mean, I mean for a family game it's it fits in that area. So we can we can throw it over the chat and see where it fits. Is it is it a burn for you then? Pretty close. Yeah. Uh I think when I rated it on here i might have gave it in a dodge and i think i might have tried to play it again after that mm -hmm. and i was just like i just got rid of it i played it one more time and then i was like who wants it please take this away from me i don't like this <laughs> game um and you know like when i collect a designer i just tend to be like i gotta have all this stuff like even you know like i own copies of games i don't like from stefan feld because i want all of them yeah uve rosenberg i have everything on this page i have almost all of them and ray cold i was just like goodbye go away oh <laughs> ray cold Poor Ray know, Cold. It's it's not too far off as far as the rankings concern or even the ratings concern, but you're right. It is definitely one of the the lower echelon of his games in, in that kind of area. I think that's what's a little bit harsh about that. I mean, I would definitely give it a play. Can you see it as far is it is it better or worse than the the what we currently have in the dodge category? Hmm. I would say, for me, the highest I would go is a dodge, but maybe we wait on it and see where everything else lands. Okay. And then kind of rank it on based on that. I'm, I mean, I can, again, it's one of those situations where it's it's a light play, as you, far as you said, or a dodge, because, you know, like you said, you dropped a lot of money for it. And again, the problem with Uwe Rosenberg's games is he's so successful in what he does, especially in the polyominoes and in the farming games that there is going to be a game that's just not going to be as good as the rest. And I'm going to surprise you a little bit later. So um, if you want to put that in the dodge category, I'm fine. Let's drop that in the dodge. Obviously I picked it up on discount. So, you know, I, I, I can kind of see that. I could see people, uh, you know, if, if it's the full MSRP, then yeah, I would say dodge. But you know, if you get a chance, if it's at the table, you can pick it up cheap, which is what I did. Then it's a play for me. All right, cool. That's fair. Let's get some more of those oddities out of the way. All right. Yeah. So there's a few in here that probably you and I have either not played or not played very much. So um, we've got the Robin Hood game, Robin of Loxley. I don't know that this has actually come out here in the U.S. yet. I don't um, believe so. Kind of run through it online, and it was fine. Um. Didn't hate it. Didn't dislike it. It's, I don't know. It Honestly, any of his games that kind of stray too far from that core formula, like he built a thing and he perfected the thing and now he, he plays did. with the thing. And those are all <laughs> great. And then anything outside of that bubble, you're like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> you know, so well, he's it's like, hard to know what I'm rating it on. He's like all those great musical artists that come on stage and he's like, I got a new song for you. You're like, play the originals. <laughs> you don't care about the new songs right exactly yeah um so and then yeah you're like we only want new stuff if it sounds like the old stuff it's true i haven't played this yet so too. i will i will bend towards your uh, opinion on this or if the chat has something to say on that too yeah i mean it's it's a light two-player game it's like a solid seven so i, I give it a play probably. all right yeah that seems to be his kind of like it it's very good for a certain population that seems to be his play area. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So let's see here. We've got Fairy Trails. Is that one you've played? Had a chance to play? I got a chance to, to kind of go through it online a bit. Uh, they they did have a module out there that you can kind of play through it. You know, again, it, it's not a bad game, but it's definitely one of those situations where it's completely forgettable for so many so many reasons. But again, that just might be because it's not his normal niche kind of situation. So I, I, I think that fits between a play and a dodge as far as I'm concerned. I mean, the artwork does bring it up, but the gameplay is a little simplistic. So I think that you could put that in the play category, you know, just because it does fit that younger family kind of niche game so it's definitely not at all in his upper echelon whatsoever but it's kind of enjoyable yeah it's you could you yeah so i'll put that in the play i think i agree 
Yeah, it's it's super duper light. It's one or two players, really just two. That's and really it, it. It's like you're moving along a path, and that's about <laughs> it. But that's good if you want something. Like we're not judging these on is it a big Uwe Rosenberg game. We're judging it on is this a good game. Yeah, and it's, it's fine. It's fine, and and again, every game doesn't have to be a super heavy complex game. It could just be fun, and that's really what we want. We want to have a fun game, especially with interesting decisions. So really, if it if it has a couple of those things, especially for that particular group, um, I think that's important. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right. So moving on to um, we've got a couple games that are similar. We've got Nova Luna, which okay. came out early last year. Um, very clever little puzzle type of game. Plays really smoothly. I love this. I gave this a buy when I reviewed it. The problem was that it's like you know, 50 components and it was $50. <laughs> That's it's crazy. A stronghold release. Why? Why uh, do they keep doing that? <laughs> I know. So I'm still saying buy. I'm not saying you should buy it, but in terms of the quality of the game, it's a buy. It's not essential. It's not that high of a tier, but I, I do love this game a lot. Would you agree then if it's that expensive for that game, but you definitely want people to play it, then it should be a play. Like you want to play someone else's copy before you invest. I mean, if the rating scale is purely based on economics, sure. But well, we're talking about like ranking his games, you know. Economics comes into play. Like Red Cold again is not the best game of all time. It's 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 the lowest, or I wouldn't say it's the lowest. It's it's low for me as far as his farming games are concerned. But price wise, if it's if it's if it's significantly cheaper and with the right group, I could see that. Uh, again, this this does have some of the other kind of generic problems to it, but it's fine. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if we're saying to buy a game, like, is that something that you need to purchase or is it something that you need to play and then decide if you need to purchase? And I think that the price point does come into play a little bit here because some of his games, especially for Uber and Rosenberg games, like they're either super light and there's not a lot in the box and you're paying a crazy amount of money or they are super heavy and there's a ton in the box and you feel like you've got your money's worth. So I don't think we can completely get rid of the economics. So I would say play, especially since it's a relatively new game. Yeah, I guess I can't argue with that logic. Cause I mean, that's more or less what my review was it's like, this game's amazing. I love it. I'm glad I have it. You shouldn't buy it. It's crazy expensive. Don't support this practice, you know? Um, so this is more a review of Stronghold Games, I guess, than Uwe Rosenberg. Okay, but I, I, I look, look, you're gonna get if you're gonna get bonus points for a good production because you went with a good company, then you're gonna get dinged if you go with a company that's overpricing your games. I'm sorry, that's right. these games are a work of art. They're a work of genius. They're a work of math, but they are a physical production and ca capitalistic, you know, product you have to purchase. So, you know, that's a thing. That's that's the thing that happens. <laughs> like if you play, if you pay money for good artwork, and the game's better for the artwork, and the game costs more, you don't really. You're like, oh, okay, but that's an investment. It's a financial investment there. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. All right. Well, the next one's easy then. Sagani. It's a yes. brand new one, but it's just based on Nova Luna. Yes. So, um... <laughs> And it's it's really about it's it's similar. It's Uve's come up with a new thing, and he's going to make a bunch of games around it. That's, he yeah. is. So, the guy knows uh, what he's doing. He's like, you know what works? This. I'm going to play this. Yeah. I'm going to play this note all the days long. Yep. Uh, the the good thing about this game is that it's Eagle Griffin, so it's yes. not fifty dollars. It's I like know. thirty or thirty five. So and it's gorgeous. Uh, yep. So I'm going to give this a play. Even though we haven't really played it yet, no. just watch the previews because it's almost certainly good because it's based on Nova Luna, which is amazing, and it's cheaper. So it'll probably move up to a buy once we play it. Once, yeah, all right. I, I'm fine with giving that a play because I, I think we do want to recommend people playing it. Uh, I, I, we're not one of those people that unfortunately got a review copy of this, but maybe, maybe we'll one day. Yep. All right, what do you got next? All right, we got a couple more oddballs here. Yes. Uh, New York Zoo. Uh -huh. uh, New York Zoo is a polyomino type of game where you're placing different zoo animals out on your on your player boards. Mm -hmm. It's not pure poly. I mean, it is pure polyominoes, but it's not like pure polyominoes like his Garden Trilogy, which we'll get to shortly. Sure. 
Uh, it, it does involve little animal meeples, and there are some other mechanics mixed in. It is a fairly light game, though. I was not particularly impressed with it. And it is like $60 because of how much stuff is in the box. There's a lot of wood. There's a lot of cardboard, a lot of pieces. I really wanted to like this game. Everything about this said, you should like this game. And I just <laughs> did, didn't love it. Um, so I'm going to make this easy. Yes. Uh, I know you haven't played it. And yes. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually going to give it a dodge. And we don't have to argue about whether this polyamino game should be higher or not. <laughs> I mean, I, honestly, like I'm like, you know, obviously you can hear from the accent. I'm from New York. I, I like the idea, but also I don't like the idea of, you know, of uh, how would you say incarcerating all the animals in the world into the zoo. That being said, as you mentioned also that he's done so many of these polyomino games that even, you know, I, I do expect a little bit better from him here. And I don't feel like at least from looking at the game that it, it, it accomplishes that. It's it's just like, it's an overproduced polyomino game. And as much as I have my personal issues with either the theme or polyominoes, I would have backed this right from the start. I would have purchased it because it's Uwe Rosenberg. And I didn't because again, the price and, and the overproduction of this game. So yeah, I'm fine with leaving it there too. Yeah. And I will say too, like, that's just our opinion. Obviously, it, it it does rate fairly well for this type of game from him. Um, I it just didn't click for me. Like I know it's not a game you would like, but it is a game that I thought I would like, and so I did buy it. I pre-ordered it, and I was surprised that I didn't. I thought it, like I played this almost immediately, and I was like, oh no, I don't think I want to play this. I'd much rather play like Zoo Loretto, um or a game like that. And you know the zoo theme being what it is, but. It just, it didn't click for me. And it's 60 bucks. It's it's super hard to recommend. Yeah. And I, like, again, if you're going to, and you should hit a game for certain things, it's an overproduction of a game and an over an overprice as far as a polyomino right. game is concerned. So, and we'll talk about that a little bit because I, I do think that some of Uwe Rosenberg's games deserve an extra tier level because of their price. And some of them are just like, what are you doing? Like, why? Why is that a thing? So, right. yeah. And even the chat saying that it, the game was disappointing. So even our chat agrees with that as well. All right. All right. So moving on, we got a couple rolling or flipping rights, I should say. Uh -huh. uh, every, everybody's got to get on the trend. Two, three years ago, Uwe was no different. So he did Second Chance and Patchwork Doodle. They both came out at the exact same time. I bought both of them at the same time. And second chance, I got rid of immediately. Uh, <laughs> did not like that game very much. And then Patchwork Doodle, I still have. The kids like it. It's not great uh, for a flip and write, but it's cute and accessible. And you get to draw, so the kids like it. Um, so second chance, the original edition of this kind of used the artwork from like the Garden Trilogy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now you can see it's got like this kind of Tetris style look. They made it look like the Ganshon Clever covers. Ooh. Uh, it's like branding now from Stronghold. It's you flip a thing, you draw a thing. It's I don't know. I don't <laughs> think it's very good in in the grand scheme of like flipping rights, rolling rights. Um, it's not the worst thing I've ever played, but it's not great. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Dodge for me on that. Yeah, so. hard dodge. There's, there's no there's no discussion. I would I would honestly even move it down a little bit lower. But yeah, let's let's call it a dodge and call it off. Let's just keep going because that's. Again, that's another very expensive game. And that's, uh, again, a, a problem I have with the polyomino games that usually it's very thin, cheap cardboard pieces and the roll and writes are, again, a very cheap game. Like, again, you're you're basically doing a lot of the work in those kind of games. And for that game to be that expensive was... Uh, well, this, this game wasn't expensive. It was only like 20 bucks. It's I just, think it's expensive for what it is. That's what I'm saying. They're all 20 bucks. All of these uh, so I don't, I don't think anything costs less than twenty dollars anymore, man. But um, some, games. some good games, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it doesn't do much either. Like you're right, it's it wasn't super engaging, and I yeah, I like I played it once or twice, and I was done with it. So all right, put in the dodge. Uh, patchwork Doodle is similar, but it uses a patchwork mechanic, so it's instantly a little more interesting and a little more fun. Um, the thing about this game that makes it not much higher than a play or dodge or play is that it's not particularly hard so it's good for kids it's a good family type of thing like yeah. 
I would not play this with other gamers because you can almost always fill in everything you need to fill in and maximize your score. And the scores end up being really close because of it. It's not super interesting. But with my children who can't play the more complicated versions of this, this is great. Mm-hmm. All right. So where do you place it? I give it a play. Okay. Yeah, I'm great. sure you haven't played it, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I've played I've played Patchwork. I haven't played the Doodle version of it. So if you okay. feel it's a play, it's a play. All right. Uh, all right, so there's that. Uh, next up, Lahav Inner Port. That's a two-player version of Lahav. Mm-hmm. What do you think of this game? I like it. It's again, it's one of those situations where Lahav itself, and I won't go into Lahav too much until we get to it. But it, Lahav is a very complex game, and it's certainly one of those situations where if you haven't played it and you're sitting down with a bunch of people, then you're going to run into all the problems. So the two-player version of this offers a variation of the game and it's a good variation not the best i'd still rather play lahav but it's something that i would play you know it's 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 fine it's not it's not like well i guess we'll i guess you know cave versus cave kind of situation which i do like better yeah agreed yeah um all right cool so that, a play for that play for that yeah all right, so moving into the last of the polyominoes before we get to the big box stuff. Um, first up, uh, Patchwork, which was the first of these he put out and yes. probably still the most famous and mm-hmm. ubiquitous. Um, for me, this is essential. I, I This is one of my favorite games. It's on my top 100. I play this. I, I think I have two or three versions of it now because I got the Christmas version this last year um, for the kids. And... Yeah, I'd play this any day. Like, it's one of my favorite two-player games, hands down. Yes, Anthony, but it's essential for me, too. Yay! Oh! <laughs> I thought we were going to have to fight about this. No! <laughs> do it! No, I love Patchwork. I was actually recently recommending this. Uh, actually, it was the the quick, essential kind of quick version of, of Patchwork. Like, Patchwork has... Yeah, Patchwork Express. I recommended that to a friend who wanted to play it with uh, a family member, and she was recommending what what two player game. And I was like, my own, if you asked me, just straight out, two player game, I would say Patchwork. If you're playing with like a non gamer gamer, but again, even if it's a little bit lighter than Patchwork Express is perfect. It's a lot more. I guess a little cuter. It's a little more less complex as far as the polyominoes are concerned. This is in my top 100. I own this game. And in fact, if it didn't go out of print, I would have bought the Christmas winter version as well. So yeah, this is essential game. I think that everyone should own patchwork. I even bought the plastic buttons. I bought that from like this board game geek store. Yeah. So yeah, I'm fully invested okay. and the, the price is very good. So like you talked about earlier, like, Yes, some of these games are all in the same price category, but Patchwork is a better game. I just I just feel like it's it just it fits that right niche where it's like it plays just as long as it needs to, it's just as complex as it needs to be, and it just it just hits all the notes perfectly. The other polynomial games are like eh, this one's like every time it just hits it hits everything. 100% agree. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. All right. So that was easy. Yeah. I thought that would be harder, but oh, hey, we're on the same page. I love it. Uh, all right. We have three more polyomino games. This is the Garden Trilogy. So they released Cottage Garden, then Spring Meadow, and then Indian Summer. And so they are pure polyomino games. You have a big box of cardboard and then whatever the rules are, and then you're filling out your boards. Um, my opinion on these is that Cottage Garden is good, right? This game was good. The other two games are not as good. All of them were too expensive. So I would argue I'd like to put Cottage Garden up at a play. Um, I don't think any of these are a buy. They're too expensive for that. Spring Meadow and Indian Summer, I I think I might have kept them just because you get the three, you put them next to each other, it creates like a little picture. Uh, and, so, and I have a problem. <laughs> but um, I have not played either Spring Meadow or Indian Summer since they came out. And I don't want to. They weren't particularly interesting to me They're, they fall really flat like mm-hmm. like uh, i think martin said on our facebook question earlier some games just fall really flat these two fell flat for me cottage garden worked 
all three of these games are incredibly expensive for what they are. And it's one of those games where when you get the box and you shake it, you're like, come on. And again, I've actually, I've actually played Cottage Garden. Uh, I haven't played Spring Meadow or Indian Summer, so I can't speak to that. But I think these were Stronghold games again, if I if I remember correctly, yep. as far as... And yep. again, it, I think these were like $60 for what was in the box. And these came after Patchwork. And I was completely stoked to buy these games. And I remember going and just lifting the box and going, really? It's a huge box. They're beautiful. I love the artwork. And as you mentioned, like... Yeah. You could sell me like, hey, you know what, Chris, there's nothing in the box, but the boxes are nice. I'm like, yeah, I'll put that on a shelf or on a wall because I really love – I love the whole idea here. I, I'm actually I'm actually sorry that they didn't go a little bit further and give us like technically give us all four seasons. Uh, but the price was outstandingly bad and for what you got in the box was completely empty. And again, it was like if you could produce a patchwork game, and I obviously patchwork had a little bit less on the component side, but it's still so great. I can't pay. I can't. Pay, I can't drop sixty dollars in those games. I'm sorry. Like I want to, but nah. Drop me a trilogy big yeah. box from a designer and publisher who actually will, you know, make it reasonable. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah with with some rule tweaks too. Like, um, yeah. I, Indian Summer in particular just didn't do it for me. I think that's the, the weakest of the three. Uh, Spring Meadow was close, but neither one of those replaced Cottage Garden, which in in the first place was fine. Yeah, yeah. Like it was like none of these are in my top one hundred. I think Cottage Garden is like a seven, seven something for me. The other two are just below that. Uh, I don't know. I I'm. It's an easy dodge, I think, for Spring Meadow and Indian Summer. I could say those are dodges. That's not a problem. Cottage Garden, I I want to say play. I, I would never say buy, though. Does that make sense? I, I agree. Okay. Okay. And I'm and I'm being kind there, because I think, that, again, that, that does a disservice, generally. Yeah. All right. So are we are we are we up to date with the polyominoes? Are we all done? Are we all polyominoed out? Yeah. Well, there's one big one left, but we'll get to that. <laughs> so <laughs> it it's a worker placement game with polyominoes. <gasps> uh, so we let's do one more, and then we'll have only big box stuff left. Caverna Cave versus Cave. Where does that fall for you? Caverna Cave versus Cave. You know, surprisingly, it's one of those games that I didn't. Like I have Caverna. I've owned Caverna from the very start. I purchased like the big box. I spent so much money here. And then you and I played Cave versus Cave. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I had no idea that they could do this differently. And in some ways like better. I was so excited to play that game. The idea that again, thematically, you're digging out this tunnel, this cave in order to get resources. And as you reveal the tunnels and, and, you know, all the different aspects of it, it now flips over and becomes a space that you can use. It's a, it's a room now. And I'm like, this is brilliant. It's thematic. And yet it's, it's like, I want to build, but every time I build, I'm giving you a chance to benefit off that building. I I, I really like it. <laughs> I, I own a copy of this. I'm sorry. I don't own a copy of the newer version, right? There's, there's a second version of this. And I think, in fact, they're coming out with a big box version that contains both of them too. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 a weird thing because it's a new version, but it's also an expansion. So you can yeah. play it standalone, or you can play it as like part two of one game, and stuff carries over from the original to the second version. So it, they tie together, which is a weird thing. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it to you, Anthony. I, I I love this game. It's again one of my like two player holster kind of situations. Like if I'm playing with non gamers, then I'm like patchwork. If I'm playing with gamers, then it's cave versus cave. Again, that push pull situation is fantastic. Yeah, no, I love it. it. It's it's an easy buy for me. I mean, I was gonna put it in buy. If that makes sense. Yeah, I'll drop it in buy too. Sounds good. All right, strong big box stuff. Oh, here what we go. Easy? <laughs> what what's easy on here? Um, I know what's easy on here. Uh, at the gates right. of Loyang. There we go. That's easy. Yeah. 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 This is a this is a strong buy for me. I love this game. Um, it 
it is one of those games though. You talk about games where you pick it up and it feels super empty. There's not much in this box. It's a big bag of vegetables and like not that big of a deck of cards. You could fit it into a tuck box, probably. Not that you should. It's a big, it's a heavier game. But when I picked this up, I was like, there's shaky, shaky, you know? Because <laughs> it's not a bunch of tiles. There's no. no tiles. There's no cardboard. It's cards, two little bits of card, cardboard for your player boards and the scoring. And then the rest is, you know, vegetable meeples. Um, but it's also wholly unique from all of his other games. It doesn't feel like the other stuff. It's not a worker placement. It has one of the best solo versions of awesome. any of his games, period. Like, I still don't know why we can't get a good one like this. This one's so good. Yeah. Um, it's an easy buy for me. It's a buy for me, too. I, I, again, you mentioned a solo version. This is my go-to solo game. I now own a lot of games, including a lot of solo versions of games. And if I have to solo and I'm not thinking about it too much, it's going to be at the Gates of Loyang. Just because the solo plays out so well... It's a little, you know, it's a little clunky with, with the kind of like shifting the cards between the two players, how you play simultaneously, but it is a solid play, if not higher. I remember I played this game way back in the day and it was out of print and I stalked this game until I actually was able to pick up. So it's, it's definitely a buy for me. Okay. That one's easy. Yep. Uh, all right, so there's at least one on. There's only one on here that I have not played, Aura and Labora, that uh -huh. I know you have. I have talked about it before, so I'll let you talk about that one because I finally got a copy not too long ago, but I haven't had a chance to play it yet. So Aura Labora is interesting because again, I picked up the newer edition. I was searching out the older edition for quite some time. They reprinted it, and I was really excited about getting this to the table because it utilizes this really interesting mechanic as far as how you kind of operate your resources what's available this kind of big kind of circle gear kind of situation so no longer it was like a pile of stuff but where that particular vegetable or resource happens to be you do a press your luck situation where do you want it to let it continue to build or do you want to pick it up before someone else picks up the resources in addition to that there are kind of two ways to play it because the cards go you know, I think it's French and German on there. And you're building up all of these different areas. So there is a huge spatial component to it. This is a game that a lot of people sleep on because, again, it is not, it's in the shadow of the big brothers here. But it is a very complex game. You do have to clear out your areas like Agricola. You do have to utilize the resources here. But you can also benefit from other people's cards, which makes this different. So it is a... I would say a very strong play and I could, you know, I could even see a buy in that case just because it is a different type of game. So yeah, or labor is, is definitely up there. It just needs an expansion, but yeah, I could see it as a buy. You want to put it in buy? I want to put it in the buy. Let's, let's throw it in the buy. We both do own it. So <laughs> we do. So, you know, and I paid full price for it too. So I was, I was happy to buy it. And, then, and again, it, it does give you enough components for the price point there, too. Got it. All right. Um, I will go ahead and do one that you have not played yet. Uh, and it's brand new, so maybe it's controversial to put it so high up. But I'm, I'm going to say Hallertau as a buy. Um, I obviously just ranked it today, and I gave it a buy rating. So <laughs> that makes that one pretty easy. I don't, I don't need to go on at length. You can just listen to the, the review from, like, 30 minutes ago. But, yeah, it's a really solid new entry in Rosenberg's games. Yeah, I watched a number of playthroughs. I paid full MSRP. I'm confident with that decision. Yeah. Okay. Um, News Fjord. So this is a buy for me, but I have a feeling it's a little lower for you. This is one of those games where like, you took a good Ove Rosenberg game and you just dunked it in a tank until like it lost all of its flavor. And I'm just like, why? Why would we play this? This is one of those situations where like Reichhold is like, maybe way too light and way too simplistic. I played News Fjord and I'm like, oh, cool. Two resources that we're managing. Oh, cool. Here's some fish. Ooh, I get some fish. Cool. All right. Can I play a game that's a, a real Uwe Rosenberg game? Because this doesn't feel like that. This feels like he just got, I, I don't know. It's too much gewilte fit. I don't know what was going on here. He had it. It's just not... It's just not a great game. It's just, if anyone else had... It is a great game. It's not a great game. It's a game. great game. No. It is. <laughs> Caverna it is a great game. It takes all the things... Of, 
<laughs> well, yeah, we'll get to Caverna. Caverna is amazing. But it's that you don't, not all the games can be Caverna, right? It, That's what I'm saying. It it's not every... one of his great games. <laughs> yeah, but it takes everything about what makes a Uwe Rosenberg or Uwe Rosenberg game. And instead of it taking three and a half hours to play, you can play it 90 minutes with up to five people. It's great. And, you still and the solo version of it is fantastic. No. You feel disappointed. You feel dirty after you smell like fish afterwards. And you're like, why? Why Why did I do that? I didn't need to do that. I could have played uh, Patchwork like four times. That's... Ah. All right. Do we have to compromise and put it... What about a play? <sighs> you're going to... I'm going to have Reichel in the dodge, but we're going to have News Forward in the play, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. We we compromised on Raycole because for me it was a burn. All right, so. all right. We'll split the difference there, unless unless the chat has anything to say about it. All right, we'll put it on my side. And if not, I have the mouse. So <laughs> there you go. That's nice. Power's gotten to my head. <laughs> Clearly, uh, that's that's a funny one. I, like I, I was always still like surprised how much you disliked it, but I was like, I thought it was great. I thought it was very clever. The first time I played it, I was like, wow, we're done already. This is awesome. It's so. It's so basic. It is like it is like pumpkin spice latte at like Starbucks. It's like, <laughs> oh my god! Like there's really good coffee out there and cappuccino, and you're like pouring like a bucket full of sugar and cream. Like I like pumpkin spice too, but man, like it's just generic. Like you'll see, you'll see when we get to we do other games here. We like other things. We like other some of these games are great. Uh, so. What about Caverna, right? Oh. I, I think of all of his games, uh, this is the one I would consider, of the big ones, the essential one, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, Caverna does everything right, except not providing as much complexity as some of his other games, like Agricola provides. Obviously, it has one expansion already out, another expansion coming that adds to the thematic flavor to it. I don't know if you need the expansion. It just plays really well as is. It is a is it a hog as far as the table is concerned, and it's a long time to build up and break down. But despite the fact that it takes so long to set up and take down, people still request it. And that's that's surprising considering how many years it's been out. And I bought this at, I think, relatively full price. And I've still been very happy with it. I even bought organizers and things. So yeah, it's, it's not just a good game. It's not just a game and a buy. It's an essential game. If you like worker placement games, if you like complexity to your games, it's essential. Yeah. Yeah, I can't argue with that at all. Um, I'm glad we're on the same page on that one because <laughs> the, the ones left. Uh, where do we put Lahav? Well, so Lahav, it, again, it, it's hard not to you know, put it in framework and context with his other games. Lahav is such a good game. It's at least a buy. The only downside to Lahav is, unlike some of these other games, and we'll talk about Agricola in a minute, unlike some of these other games, if you are not on the same page and the same skill level or you come into that game, you get crushed. There is no... Yeah. There is just no flexibility because... It, it does play in a certain pattern. You have to understand, like, you will be able to get resources here, but not here, not here. You get them here. You'll be able to get your cards here. Like, you really have to, like, map out, plan out the entire, almost the entire game, in fact. And if you don't, if you don't have that, and sometimes you have to get lucky, too, because your turn order, based upon what you can get, is very, very tight. So if you're not in that right turn order and what you needed was resources, and they're gone, you're done. That's it. You're done. That's that's the game. You're just like, ah. Oh. We talk about splatters, but Lahav is just as painful. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, I, that's a perfect way to word it. It does feel like Uwe's splatter, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I, I can't give it an essential, but I can certainly give it a buy. All right. I, I agree. I own it. I love it. I... I have turned down playing it several times though, depending on who was playing, the number of players playing. Yeah. Like the a... one time I think it was gonna be four of us and two people were new, and I was like, I do not have five hours right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, player count is essential in that game. It is it is it is good and bad at certain player counts. So I would agree again, because it's that very much like 
if you have different player counts, how the board reacts and the player reacts is differently. Yeah. All righty. Um, all right. Agricola, all creatures, big and small. So this, I've never actually played this because we all know my opinions on the on the main game. Uh, so I never had a chance to play this. Have you played this? I have actually owned a copy of it. It's fine. It really isn't Agricola because it doesn't have cards. Really, it's it's basically just kind of managing the worker placement element where you place the animals into the different pens. Uh, it's kind of forgettable, but it's also fine. So as far as that's concerned, I don't, you know, if he would have named it anything else, I, I think it might have been done a little bit better. It's not as good as Cave versus Cave by far. So I can't recommend it as a buy. I could maybe give it a play. I don't think it's a dodge, but I think it's either a very light play or a, I, I would say it's a light play. I would give it a light play. It's not a bad game. I, I would certainly, and the price is relatively good for what you get in the game, which is a lot of animeables. Yeah. Okay. And then what about the family edition? So I know they streamlined this game. They took a bunch of stuff out and simplified it. And they're like, it's for families now. And I've not heard good things. So. So there's always been a family version in Agricola in the rule book where basically you don't play with the cards. So that was at least historically, that was the family version. And when the new versions came out, they did streamline the rules. They did streamline the boards out there, but it was, again, it was just, it, it wasn't what essentially is Agricola, which is the cards. So I don't know if it's as bad as a dodge is concerned, but it fits between the play and dodge area just because it is a little, it's almost in a case, a little simplistic like Reichold, but also it is a little more complex and kind of fits more in the idea of like a news forward, at least for me, as far as the weight is concerned. So it could kind of go either way. I'm going to say dodge because again, why would you own this and Agricola? Like you wouldn't do that. Like you would play Agricola. It's yeah. It's and there's if yeah. There again, there are other farming games that are lighter and easier. So again, I like Reichold a little bit more. You like News Forward more. You know, I, I think then if you did want to do that kind of thing, you could do that with other games. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um. All right. Uh, have you played Fields of Arl? I have and Glass Road too. I've okay. played all. Yep. So. I, I don't know if it goes up there necessarily, but on my personal list, I would consider Fields of Arl to be essential as a two-player. It's it's the it's designed as a two-player game, so it is the big box game that plays best with two. And the expansion takes it to three, and it works well. But this is if you want a big long Euro designed for two people, because most of these games that are designed for two are either really short or they're like war games. So you want a Euro just for two people, it's Fields of Arl, right? It fits that niche, and it's honestly the only thing that really fits that niche. Um, it also plays amazingly at one. Now, it is a big sandboxy type of game. Some people don't love that. But I don't know. It's it's If you ask me to keep two Uwe Rosenberg games off of this list, it would be really difficult to choose between this and the other two essential games that are up there for me. Yeah, so let, I'm going to ask you one question because I've played... I've played this at two players and I played the three player with the expansion. I haven't played this as solo. So your argument here, which I don't disagree with as far as this is kind of like the essential two player Uwe Rosenberg, heavy kind of farming game. Is this the two player heavy game you go to, or do you go to a Vital Asserta game? For two? Like, would you play two? Like, Solo and two. Like you're saying, is this the heavy solo game that you would turn to? Not solo. Two, though. But two. Yeah, it's the it's... best player game that you would say? In a Euro, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a very narrow slice that we're talking about. Like, it's not my favorite two-player game of all time. That's War of the Rings. Sure. But for a Euro itself, just straight up, yeah. I... It is. It's... I mean, I find this, it's okay. I, I, I don't feel it's essential for me. I don't own a copy of it as far as, like, a buy is necessary. It's a play for me. I did find, like, the whole carding action. You know, it, it has a lot of similarities to Feast for Odin, but it's obviously a lot more streamlined than that. 
and there's like the left and right and right of, of the the board so to speak so it's it's not Seasons. yeah, yeah it's, it's not bad but honestly i would i i don't feel it's essential i i i give you a buy on that because I, I i think that it's obviously something that if you did see for sale or even again if, even if it was full price and you needed something for that right player count i think it fits that that area yeah, I didn't. I didn't necessarily think we'd get it to essential. I just, it, it is on my personal essential, but I, I know that it's not in that tier necessarily for other people. Yeah, I it's, that. it's a play for me, but I, I'll split the difference with you and make it a buy. Okay. All right. Uh, Glass Road. Glass Road is a a lot of fun. Glass Road has a recent reprint, which I'm still on pre order for. So I don't think there's been any changes to it as of yet, but Glass Road, again, it is a variation on all of his other kind of farming games, but obviously this is all about building up industry and such. It's a fine game. Again, I'm waiting for the pre-orders for, so for me, it's it's still in the buy arena. It's still, it's still a good enough game. It, do, it still has enough complexity to it. It could use a mini expansion, for the end, but uh, yeah, it's it's a buy. I would give it a buy. I would recommend purchasing it. I have this. I've played it. I liked it. I didn't love it. Um, this is I, one with the wheels, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like, it's a cool mechanic. It's different. I like when he finds creative ways to manipulate the resources. It's one of the reasons I like Howard Tau. Uh, so I, I, it's a high play, low buy for me, but if it's a buy for you, I'm happy putting it up there. Yeah, I think we could put it up. It's either way for me too. I'm not I'm not tied to it, but I did buy it. So nonetheless, I could As did I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now the two <laughs> we're probably just gonna both end up in play so we don't kill each other. <laughs> um Agricola and a feast for Odin. Uh, so I think we're we're on polar opposites here. For me, a feast for Odin is a buy and Agricola's a dodge to a burn. <laughs> Because I really don't like it. Hey, and I, I have a feeling you Yeah, exactly. You're the flip, I would I'm imagine. Flip on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh we've had this argument so many times. I don't even know how to make the case anymore. Um Yeah, Feast for Odin, man, it's just it's everything. He just dumped literally everything it into is. the bucket. And so I understand when some people look at that and they're like, uh but for me it's like Avengers Endgame, right? It's like everything's <laughs> in there, it's great. <laughs> Uwe Rosenberg is like oh, opening no. portals and you've got like polyominoes coming through you got workers coming through you got there's a die in there for no reason like yeah it's all here it's oh god it's so bad and then Agricola is Agricola is oh man well look I think that we can agree on this is that both games are identical in being the nth degree, right? So Agricola is the nth degree when it comes to the cards, right? The, the actual worker placement element is some of the best worker placement, but it's worker placement. There's nothing radically different to it. It's right. The building of the farm is is great and it's but it's again it's nothing that's you haven't necessarily seen before or better somewhere else the cards really it comes down to the cards and again there is a situation where there's a lot of cards there's multiple decks he keeps bringing out new decks and again if you sit down at the table and someone's like all right cool let's play agricola then you have to go well what decks are you playing with because if you don't know the decks you're not necessarily sure what you're drafting and if you don't draft, then you're getting a random hand of cards and someone just might win based on the ra- on the hand of cards. So it does have that, you know, block that, al- that doesn't allow easy approachability. But I've played this with just gamers for the first time and they get it. Again, it's just a matter of like the cards of the dense part. Feast for Odin, as you mentioned, is it does feel like it's literally everything he's ever done. It's all the polyominoes. It's all the worker placement. I mean workers. Like you're throwing multiple workers just to activate a spot. It is all of the farming-esque placement. You get this giant board and it has all negatives on it. And you're like, cool, fill this out. And I'm like, all right, I filled it out. Would you want another board? Would you want another island to fill out? (laughs) You know? (laughs) And then even the polyominoes part, which I'm not the biggest fan of, 
although patchwork is essential for me, where like you flip it over and it's a different piece. So management organization, it's a fiddly game. It's just, a, it's, it is like, it's, it's like, it gets three fiddles for me, three out of four fiddles. It's just all the fiddles. So I, again, I, I'm the same thing as you do. I do respect people who love Feast for Odin because I get it. Like, I get it. Like, it has everything. It has polyomnos, it has worker placement, it has feeding your Vikings. <laughs> you know, like, you gotta put these odd-shaped foods in the right order to be able to fill the whole yep. table. Like, okay. Like, uh, uh, so, yeah. All right. Well, look, I, I, I think that we we both agree at the very least that people should play both of these because there is some and i won't say i'm not saying they're essential but i think there's an essential quality to both of these games right both of these games you can't argue that they're classics you can't argue that they're going to go they're not they're going to be here forever right they're going to be modern day classics whether or not <laughs> you want to play them or if you feel like how hit in the head you have to be that's a different story so i i think that we can both say that they're both plays right they're not yeah i get the fact that you want to burn agricola because i want to burn feast for odin and honestly i think i get more heat out of the feast for odin there's just a lot more stuff in the box it's a um, lot of bits in there yeah a lot of bits in that box dodge i mean i mean can we recommend look they're both obtuse right can we say they're both obtuse I think we could yes. we could agree to that the cards and all the stuff they're just obtuse. So <sighs> plays, I mean, I mean, I, do you... I think so. I th I think whatever we do, they kind of have to be in the same tier. Yeah, just because we're both on the same page. And the thing is, like, I recognize Agricola is his most recognizable game, and I don't care. <laughs> like, I'm just like, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> From a pure argument standpoint, I'll even make your argument for you. It should probably be higher, but. I there's no way I could let Feast for Odin go below play, and I don't really want Agricola higher than a play, so that's hard for me. <laughs> I feel like they you get shackled down when you play Feast for Odin because not not only is it a long game, but there's so many thousands of pieces and like, hey, can you find the bread tokens? I can't find the bread tokens. Oh, you gotta flip over the the roast tokens. The bread's on the other side. You're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> You've got to use the trays. They come with trays, and then you put some on one side, and you put some on the other and another thing. That's what it's for. It comes with the trays. But they're, they're, the, the tokens are going to flip over. The tokens are going to flip. They're not going to stay one-sided up. What are you the whole doing? Thing. You punch in the on, table? Man. What are you doing over there? Come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is going to be a compromise where neither one of us is happy. Um, <laughs> oh, man. So the, the chat's saying that you know, there's obviously someone here is saying, yeah, Feast was too much. Someone's saying that some games were meant to put in digital form. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think if Feast for Odin was in a digital form, it would be a lot easier to consume. I We don't have the, that in digital. We do have Agricola in a digital version. You can you can play digital Agricola. There is a video bad. game version. It's bad, though. It is bad. It's, I'm, bad. I'm not... it's old, right? It's one of the first ones, so it's not very good. Well, they did a they did a good job when they came out, but the problem is, it's like there's the action board screen, then there's your your own farm, but then you also have to see what everyone else is doing. So, it's really hard to follow. You need to have you need to get the whole thing mentally on on the screen somewhere. So, uh, yeah. obviously, earlier people were talking about board game arena picking up Agricola, so they should do that. Maybe they should do the same thing for Feast for Odin. So, let us say we'll put both of them in the play. With with our own very own asterisks, I think that uh, Agricola is higher and Feast for Odin is lower, and vice versa for you. And uh, we can move on with Uwe Rosenberg. Maybe uh, <laughs> maybe one day he'll be able to split the difference. Yeah, we'll get a uh, we'll we'll throw some polyominoes in the Agricola universe and get Chris an aneurysm. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do it. Leave it alone. <laughs> it's, it's it's had multiple. Oh revisions. my god. I would love it so much if he was like Agricola, the Feast for Odin edition. <laughs> you already have, have to buy it. Oh my god, it's so many, so many pieces, so many pieces. Oh, uh, man. All right, so are we happy with everything on here right now? Is there anything we want to move? Let's see, Patchwork and, and Caverna. I, I think we all agree. The chat agrees. Essential. I think that's 
let's feel on that yeah right yeah yeah i think so like if you're gonna take any two of these games and just recommend them as like the pure distillation of what uve rosenberg does it's those two yeah and again i think you could possibly because it's a it's a very different game but you could possibly make an argument that bonanza is an essential game because it is a modern day classic that has never changed. Like it's been there forever. It's just one of those things that it's just like, it's a, such an oddity that I don't think that people are going to necessarily just want to own it. Like I wouldn't feel comfortable with telling people you should own Bonanza because it's, it's unique in it's so many different ways. Like I think it's, it's a, an acquired taste it's a weird odd beautiful game but it is it is one of those things where you can certainly see as an essential for many people out there i know daniel back in the day that was one of his favorite games of all time Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah i I think i'm with you on that like i would consider it like of that quality but yeah because of the weirdness of it it's it's difficult to say like patchwork is the two-player game for euro gamers right it is the like if you're going to recommend five two-player games it's in that list of five if you're going to recommend five worker placement five euro games period caverna's in that five so um i don't know that anything else here really rises to that so i'm happy with where those are at yeah again it's just one of those situations where a lot of his games are unique obviously they break down to like three categories like there's the farming there's a polyominoes and then there are the, you know, straight up oddities here. And Bonanza is the best of all the oddities. And it ranks high up there, of course, everything else there. So, yeah, yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely up there. But I, I don't think it's essential for everyone's collection. It's not, I don't own a copy. I don't know. Do you own a copy? You I have it. the kids version. I have the yeah. family version. But you didn't feel the need to own the, the big version, that is? No, no. Yeah. All right, I, I like it. It's it's a funny game, but like it, it's also very specific player counts and the types of people you play it with. So it's the kind of thing like if if I'm with people who want to play it, somebody has it, so I'll play their copy, <laughs> and then it's good for family. So I have a family version. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, not essential for everybody, but it would be that one game that is odd enough that every on every other full moon that maybe it pops up to that category. All right. So that is our list our tiered list of Uwe Rosenberg games. Obviously, there is a lot of discussion to follow this. Please hit us up and let us know what your list is, where you think certain things rank. If you love or hate them or feel like they deserve to be somewhere else, we would love to hear from you and hear where you'd actually place everything, especially Bonanza. That's definitely a conversational starter. Um, At the very least, you should definitely buy the game because it's something that, you know, it's good to have. All right, Anthony, so that's everything for this week. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at Uwe Rosenberg's Tiered Table. Take care, everybody. Bye.